Ben and Neil, are you guys set up and good to go? And we're all good. Let's give it a couple more minutes. Checking in. Which one of you guys is going first? Uh, I am. This is Dan. I know your voice, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be worried. We if don't you, leave anything to chance. We'd be worried if you couldn't tell us apart. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> more years. So as we're as we're waiting before we start, I'll I'll remind everyone again, both on the Zoom and in the room, if you want to participate, and we encourage you to participate in audience response and audience guests, you can you can text. DDD Emory to 22333. And that'll allow you to sign in to the poll everywhere and participate in the questions as they come up. All right, so on that note, let me uh, make some introductions here. I'm, I'm really, um, uh, welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm uh, incredibly grateful to our two presenters today who um, are reprising a very popular uh, um, Grand Rounds episode, if you will, that they did um, in years past uh, on an update in hospital medicine. They are both folks who should be well known to everybody on this call, um, but I am still gonna give them a formal introduction because they deserve that. So Dr. Daniel Dressler is a professor of medicine, master clinician, uh, director of the internal medicine teaching services at Emory University Hospital, uh, associate program director for the internal medicine residency program, and uh, is both a medical student society advisor and leads the medical student society's leadership council. He completed his undergraduate training at Duke in physics, followed by medical school, internal medicine residency, hospital medicine fellowship, and the master's of science in clinical research um, here at Emory. He has won multiple teaching, leadership, and mentoring awards, including the Department of Medicine's Educator Impact Award. Um, in addition, and I'm shortening you know, a lot of his accomplishments for both of these individuals, I'm doing that. Um, he's done uh, numerous presentations, has served on dozens of national committees, and has been a course director for more than 25 national and regional conferences, including the Society of Hospital Medicine's annual meeting. He's a past recipient of the SHM's National Excellence in Teaching Award and was bestowed Master of Hospital Medicine in 2020. He also serves as deputy editor for the New England Journal of Medicine's Journal Watch General Medicine and a contributing editor for the uh, NEJM Journal Watch Hospital Medicine. Dr. Neil Winower is a professor of medicine at Emory as well um, in general internal medicine where he rounds at Grady um, and is a very popular uh, teacher there. He attended medical school at SUNY Health Science Center in Brooklyn and completed his residency training at NYU Bellevue Hospital, which has prepared him well, I think, for Grady. He has uh, areas of clinical interest that include medical errors, venous thromboembolism, and allergic reactions. He's lectured also on hospital medicine topics internationally and has been an advisor for the Brazilian Society of Hospital Medicine. He has published in leading textbooks and journals of hospital medicine and is the founding editor of the New England Journal of Medicine's Journal Watch Hospital Medicine. 
So um, uh, uh, as part of uh, Journal Watch and so on, um, uh, both of our presenters have their finger on the pulse of um, new developments in hospital medicine, in addition, obviously, to their practices. And um, we're uh, and are always willing to do this update for us, but were so kind to me when I really um, begged them to do it a little bit earlier in the year than they wanted to in order to help um, fill this particular um, spot on the Grand Round schedule. So I'm grateful to both of you. This is a session I always look forward to, and I know we all learn a lot from. So I will turn it over to you, Drs. Dressler and Winnower, and I think, Dan, you're going first. Thanks so much, Wendy. Very kind, and uh, and Neil and I always have uh, fun with this. Uh, so appreciate everyone joining, both in the room and uh, on Zoom land. And we'll say again for anyone who wants to participate in audience response, there will be questions throughout, uh, which will have multiple guests that you guys can enjoy at your leisure. So to do that, text DDD Emory to 22333, and that'll allow you to participate in the audience response. Um, uh, just financial disclosures. I have no financial disclosures with any pharmaceutical or device industry. As uh, Dr. Armstrong mentioned, I do do some uh, writing. Uh, Dr. Winnower uh, also does a lot of writing, but also does not have any uh, disclosure with any financial relationships with any pharmaceutical or device industry. Uh, I should say Dr. Winnower and I, have, uh, I've been lucky to work with him. He's been one of my mentors since uh, intern year when I rounded on his team. And then I did it again in uh, my senior year as a, as a PGY3 resident. And so got to learn a lot. And then Dr. Winnower does great care for lots of patients. And, and I was lucky to actually have him take care of one of my close family members recently. And I have a picture of that uh, that I want, really want to show you. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Winnower uh, taking care of my, uh, my very close automobile um, and I know that you may not think that you could tell that that's him, but I assure you that's him in, in his garage. Uh, and this was the problem that was in my garage uh, that uh, we were working on at that time. Um, so in addition, Dr. Winnemore's financial relationships, he should have mentioned here that he competes with most local auto mechanics for any make and any. Okay, so let's get started. So our objectives are for you guys to be able to identify, interpret, and incorporate into clinical practice the recently published literature that provides evidence for that changes our practice in hospital medicine. We're going to talk about fluids. I didn't have enough room here to include all of the objectives, uh, but I'll list here some of the topics we're going to include, which is IV fluids in various forms, uh, pulmonary, uh, including pulse oximetry, uh, cardiology, inpatient hypertension, healthcare safety, and then maybe hopefully we'll have some time for hepatorenal syndrome and COPD, but we'll, we shall see. Okay, so just to start us out with a case. So we have a 66 year old patient who presents to the ED with fever, cough, shortness of breath, hypotension, elevated lactate, elevated white count, is acidemic, I'm to have pneumonia and sepsis. The patient received a couple of liters of IV fluid in the ED, but remains hypotensive. Oppressor agent is started. You're admitting the patient to the ICU for septic shock. And so we're going to talk about fluids. So let's talk about, I have a couple of questions for you guys. And to participate, you can do that. And it's listed here. If you want to text uh, DDD Emory to 22333, you can participate in the audience response. So what type of IV fluid is uh, will best optimize our patient's uh, outcomes in this critically ill patient? Is it normal saline? Is it lactated ringers? Is it plasma light? Is it IV coffee? Or is it IV tea? And I'll let you choose among those options. I'll give you a few seconds. Very glad many of you. So we've got uh, a plethora of individuals who want to go with lactated ringers, uh, subportion that want to do normal saline, a few with plasma light and some are into tea. Okay, so next question for you, we're going to get to the answers for these. What rate and amount of IV fluids will best optimize our critically ill patients' outcomes? 
is at a rate of about a thousand cc's an hour. Bolus based on the clinician determined clinical need is at based on about a third of a liter an hour uh, with only bolusing with evidence of hypoperfusion. Is it giving 200 cc's per hour and no boluses? Is it getting keep vein open at 25 cc's an hour or is it the BPH slow trickle at about five cc's per hour? And we'll let you guys decide on those options. Okay, so most of you, after this patient's received a few liters, uh, want to still pull us pretty heftily. A few people want to be uh, more conservative with it. And so let's look at some of the evidence for these. So the first set of studies is... I'm going to leave as this. Okay, so the first set of studies is uh, balanced multi-electrolyte solution versus saline in critically ill patients. This was a randomized controlled trial uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine this year. And then a new journal that uh, some of you may have been have seen is called Nejum Evidence. Uh, and that is publishing, you know, really valuable quality information that impacts practice. And so they published uh, balanced crystalloid uh, versus saline in critically ill adults. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis of the published randomized control trials. So many of you probably remember Back in 2018, there was a, a single center randomized controlled trial uh, that did demonstrate some lower mortality and fewer renal injuries in patients who are receiving balanced crystalloids, such as lactated ringers or plasmolite, compared to those receiving normal saline. And so now, already five years ago, that led many of us to change our clinical practice and use lactated ringers a bit more, uh, just like the surgeons have been doing for years and years. Uh, but then there was another multi-center randomized control trial in 2021 that really couldn't confirm these results. And so the question here was, does, does this balanced multi-electrolyte solution like LR compared to normal saline, does that improve outcomes in critically ill patients? And so this was an RCT, over 5,000 patients who were critically ill. These were a relatively sick patient population. They had an Apache score of almost 20. They had a median SOFA score of five that puts their mortality risk at about 25% uh, uh, while in the ICU. Uh, three quarters of them were intubated and they received either normal saline or plasmolite during their ICU stay. The second study that we'll touch on is this meta-analysis that looked at all 13 randomized controlled trials, including this above uh, RCT, and that included almost 36,000 patients that were critically ill. Half of the studies were blinded, the other half were unblinded, and the, and the meta-analysis did assess the studies for risk of bias uh, within the studies, and they also looked at, again, was it normal saline compared to some sort of multi-electrolyte solution, whether that was LR, plasmolite, or Hartman's solution. So what did they find? So first, the RCT, you can see here there really was no difference in, in 90 day mortality, no difference in renal replacement therapy that was required. Uh, organ failure was similar in both groups. So, whether you received uh, plasma light solution or you received normal saline, your outcomes were pretty much exactly the same. And again, that was about 5,000 patients. When you look at the 36,000 patients, the larger number of patients who uh, looked at those 13 RCTs, again, we're seeing the same thing, uh, about a 0.8% difference, 90-day mortality. The authors here tried to, uh, tried to look at just the studies that were low, that they call low risk of bias that was done in a structured way. And, they, and they're saying, oh, well, you, you still see that 0.8% difference, but your, your statistical significance is getting closer to statistical significance. Remember, this is with tens of thousands of patients that were seeing about a 0.8% difference. Uh, that would have equated to about a number needed to treat of about 120 if you gave a solution like LR rather than uh, normal saline. So, so possibly helpful. Um, other outcomes were no different. Plasmolite did not have any better outcomes than any, any of the other uh, balanced electrolyte solutions. And so the conclusion here is that Balanced crystalloid and normal saline really have similar outcomes in critically ill patients uh, who are requiring fluid resuscitation. Potentially, there's still some subgroups that might benefit from one solution versus the other, 
um, but we don't have enough uh, data on that to say definitively. So remember the surviving sepsis guidelines, they were updated at the end of 2021. Uh, that They recommended balanced crystalloid over normal saline for resuscitation. But the, the more recent data since those guidelines were published are essentially suggesting that they're, they're more or less equivalent. Cost is pretty much the same for LR and normal saline. Plasma light is significantly more expensive, so I wouldn't recommend using that on a uh, standard basis. And what I'm probably doing is using LR because it's readily available, but it's the saline's right there and, I'm in, and it's the easiest to get to and quickest to get to. We're gonna pull that out as well. The next couple of studies look at rate of fluid uh, resuscitation. And so we'll pull up these couple of studies, one from JAMA, uh, published at the end of 2021, and another is the classic trial published in New England Journal of Medicine. And so the background here is that, you know, our guidance on fluid rate is somewhat limited. Uh, there is some data in children that IV fluid boluses may have worse outcomes. And so our question is, you know, in, in our critically ill patient population, we need to do slower versus faster uh, with respect to IV fluid rate. And so the first study is a randomized controlled trial published in JAMA, 11,000 patients who are critically ill. Uh, but an important piece here is that this was not the same level of illness as the prior studies that we looked at. Uh, this patient population was uh, about half of them were admitted to the ICU for uh, after elective surgery. Uh, their Apache, mean Apache score was around 12 and their mean SOFA score was around four, putting their mortality risk about 10 to 15% rather than 25%. And so just keeping that in mind, only about 20% of these patients actually were being admitted with sepsis to the ICU. So they looked at IV fluid rate, 1,000 cc's versus a third of a liter. Um, and what outcomes did they find? Well, they found that essentially 90-day outcomes were no different between if you got fast infusion at 1,000 cc's an hour versus slower infusion at about a third of a liter an hour. Uh, AKI discharge was also no different. Length of stay was no different. What about if we look at septic shock? So this is the newer study from New England Journal of Medicine by Myoff. Um, and remember, our guidelines are recommending 30 cc's per kilogram as initial bolus. And so looking at patients with septic shock, does conservative versus liberal IV fluid infusion amounts, does that affect mortality? They looked at only about 1,500 patients with septic all these patients were in septic shock. They were very ill. Uh, they were randomized within 24 hours after identifying the septic shock. They had all received, they say at least a liter, but on average they were receiving two to three liters before, uh, before they were being randomized. The restrictive group was, was then only getting IV fluids uh, based on hyperperfusion, which was based on an elevated lactate, a low MAP, low urine output, or modeling above the knees. And they were getting only 250 to 500 cc's of boluses uh, based on that need. The standard group had no restrictions and they were getting uh, bolus based on the clinician discretion. Uh, and again, this is after the initial bolus usually happening in the ED. So both, both groups could receive IV fluids to replace losses. And again, the groups were receiving about three liters on average prior to being randomized. So what did they find? Well, they found that Again, mortality was no different uh, if you bolused based on hyperperfusion and did small bolus, smaller boluses, or you bolus based on just your gestalt and did oftentimes larger boluses. And so the conclusion between uh, among these two studies is that, well, in lesser ill, critically ill patients, you can probably bolus at a lower rate at, at about a third of a liter you know, so maybe 250 to 500 cc's uh, boluses versus 1,000 cc boluses. In patients with septic shock, after they've already received those initial boluses, uh, then you can probably bolus based on hypoperfusion and you don't need to just keep on bolusing with large boluses after those first two or three liters. There's some caveats that I won't go over in detail, but they're there for your information. And so the sepsis guidelines, surviving sepsis guidelines did recently downgrade their 30 cc's per kilogram of IV fluid bolus within that first three to six hours um, as a weak recommendation based on some of the prior evidence as well as some of this newer evidence uh, is 
can be helpful, maybe impacting some of your practice. So for those of you who said either normal saline or lactated ringers, either of those were fine. Plasma light, I'm mostly staying away from just based on cost right now. And then the rate of IV fluids, if you said a little bit lower based on hypoperfusion evidence, you're probably right. You're probably not wrong if you did uh, a little bit higher rate, especially if you're doing that initial bolus, uh, which some of us are still doing that you might see on the floor if someone becomes septic or uh, if you're seeing them very early in their uh, ED stay. Okay, so our patient received normal saline or, or LR uh, based on fluid availability and after the initial ED bolus and only based on hyperperfusion did they get initial repeat boluses. They received a total of about six liters during their four-day ICU stay. They did not get volume overloaded. They were weaned off pressors on ICU day number three, and then they were trenched to the floor and discharged home on hospital day number five. Okay, so just a touch more on fluids. We have a 26-year-old patient with type 1 diabetes, presents the ED uh, with URI symptoms, doesn't have any evidence of pneumonia or any other severe significant infection. And so the patient was found to be in DKA, thought to be related to the URI. So you're admitting the patient for DKA and trying to decide on fluid management. And so what kind of fluids do we want to use in our patient who's being admitted for DKA? Is it A, normal saline, B, crystalloid or lactated ringers, C, IV coffee again, D, IV tea again. And I'll let you guys decide among those for our DKA patient. Seems like we got a little bit of an arm wrestling match. We're about 50-50 or close to that uh, for normal saline versus lactated ringers. And so let's look at some of what some of the data says. So this is balanced electrolyte solution uh, versus saline in patients with DKA. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. There honestly aren't very many studies out there, but question comes up because the guidelines are recommending normal saline. But we know when we give normal saline, we're giving a lot of excess chloride content, which might delay correction of acidosis. And so these, these authors were essentially investigating in patients with DKA, is there, have there been studies that have compared normal saline to LR essentially, or other balanced electrolyte solutions? And so they only found three randomized controlled trials, about 300 patients or so, uh, that compared normal saline versus the balanced electrolyte solution. And again, these are in adults. And so here's what they found. They found that on average, uh, and these, these studies were considered to have low heterogeneity, uh, that the average was that patients receiving lactated ringers or balanced electrolyte solution were actually uh, getting out of DK a little bit faster. How much faster? By about four hours. That might not seem like very much, but there, I, my, my personal experience is there are many times where I'm getting patients out of DKA in somewhere between six and 18 hours. And so a four, a four hour shift could be a pretty significant amount. And so based on this information, and there are a couple of new uh, larger studies that are, that are ongoing right now. So that may, we may get more information on this fairly soon, but based on this, I think it's uh, A-OK, -okay, even though the guidelines say to use normal saline to maybe switch over to use lactated ringers. So you could say either one, um, and based on if you want to go with the guidelines or you want to go with the more recent evidence. Okay, now we're going to turn a little bit to pancreatitis. So we have a 46-year-old patient presents the ED with epigastric pain. All the signs and symptoms and lab findings are suggestive of pancreatitis uh, that is not uh, super ill. The lactate is normal, uh, no acidosis. CT of the abdomen showed an obstructing gallstone, peripancreatic stranding, no other significant. Uh, adverse findings. And so you're admitting this patient for ERCP, deciding on optimal fluids for this patient. And so what fluid bolus and rate will best optimize this patient's outcomes? Uh, is it do no bolus and do about 100 cc's an hour? Is it do you know about a liter and a half or so of bolus and do 100 cc's an hour? You want to do a three liter bolus and 200 cc's an hour? 
a three liter bolus and 300 cc's an hour, or you want to do a five gallon bolus and a rate of infinity. So let you let you choose among those options. Great, you guys are excellent at designing bell curves. Um, so we've got a, a mix of, of, of everything under the sun here. So let's look at some of the data because I'll say honestly, previously I've been uh, really aggressive with IV fluids in my patients with pancreatitis, even mild pancreatitis based on some prior data. And so, but there was some new, newer data that just came out from New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this is aggressive or moderate fluid resuscitation in acute pancreatitis. And we all know that the guidelines are, are pretty much recommending uh, aggressive IV fluids, but some meta-analysis data is suggesting there might be worse outcomes. And so what is the safety and efficacy of aggressive IV fluids versus more conservative IV fluids in the setting of pancreatitis? So they did a randomized control trial. Their intent was to get about 750 patients um, this trial got stopped at the first interim analysis at about 250 patients, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second, um, but in, in essence, they were comparing aggressive fluid resuscitation, which was about 20 cc's per kilogram and then 3 cc's per kilogram per hour, which is like, what the heck does all that mean? That just means that you're getting about a liter and a half to two liters of bolus followed by 200 cc's an hour. That's aggressive resuscitation versus moderate resuscitation where you're getting uh, a bolus of 10 cc's per kilogram, which is about 750 cc's or 750 to 1,000 cc's bolus, but only if you have evidence of hypoperfusion, meaning you're hypovolemic, you're orthostatic, uh, you have some other evidence of hypovolemia. Um, otherwise, you're just getting one and a half cc's per kilogram per hour, which is about 100 cc's an hour for most people, 100, 125 cc's an hour. So what did they find based on this early interim analysis? Well, they stopped it because uh, there was a significantly higher uh, number of patients who had volume overload in one group versus the other with a number needed to harm of seven for patients who were getting aggressively treated or aggressive IV fluids. All the other parameters were unchanged uh, or did not have significant differences, but they were all leaning towards worse outcomes uh, with the patients who received aggressive IV fluids, uh, potentially worse necrotizing pancreatitis that didn't reach statistical significance, uh, but it was leaning that way pretty, pretty heavily, um, as well as some of the other outcomes. Deaths, again, were not significantly different, although there were more in the aggressive resuscitation. Again, these patients were randomized, uh, but I don't believe that there was blinding possible. So what does that mean? What should we do based on this open label study that was stopped early? Well, we probably need to pull back a little bit on how much we're doing resuscitation and base our resuscitation based on patient's level of hypovolemia and, and then do boluses based on that if they are hypovolemic and then cut our rate down a bit. Uh, and patients will probably do either just as well or maybe a little bit better and we won't volume overload them. So too much fluid can be harmful. And so potentially taking a more moderate approach, acknowledging that we need to clinically and hemodynamically monitor patients in the first two to three days to make sure that they are doing well with this approach. So for those of you who chose uh, no bolus in our patient who was not hypovolemic uh, at a, and then a rate of 100 cc's an hour, that's, uh, that was based on this study, what we would have done with this patient. So a quick break before I hand over to Dr. Winnower. We've been talking about coffee or tea or either one of these actually good for you. A, neither reduces mortality, but that's not stopping me from drinking a gallon per day. B, only coffee is associated with reduced mortality. C, only tea is, has reduced mortality. Both are associated with reduced mortality. Or E, both are only associated with reduced mortality, but only if you don't include uh, sugar and cream in your coffee or tea. So I'll let you choose among those options. And I'm not going to spend much time so I can give Dr. Winner one of the reins here. 
but most of you think you can drink coffee or tea, they're gonna improve your longevity, but only if you exclude your sugar and creamer. Okay, so this is not, Dr. Winner is gonna talk about quality. We're talking about the coffee versus tea chasm. Um, and so these two studies came out this past year, use of sugar sweetened and artificially sweetened coffee or tea. Um, one was on the coffee side, another was on the tea side. And just to cut to the chase, for coffee, uh, looking at over 170,000 patients follow up for seven years, uh, if you sweeten it uh, or not, you still get benefit of mortality reduction. For tea, again, whether it's green tea or black tea, we have prior data on green tea. This newer study was mostly on black tea, which is consumed in the US and the UK. Um, follow up for 11 years, drinking two cups or more of tea was also associated with reduced mortality by about close to a percent and results did not differ based on whether or not you added milk or sugar to your tea. And so the conclusion is sweet coffee or tea, sweet or not, latte or not in moderate amounts will improve your longevity. So those who guessed that, awesome. And, and then we'll encourage you guys to drink up. We'll shift gears a little bit. Uh, no more liquids, just pushing me into the drink. <laughs> okay, thanks, Danny boy. Let's jump right into my portion. Same case as Dan's first patient, but uh, I want to focus on the patient's vital signs, blood pressure 90 over 60, heart rate 115, respiratory rate of 30, and patient is, has low-grade fever, O2 sats are 98%. But on exam, a black male who looks tachypnic has rails at the right base, elevated uh, lactate as well and leukocytosis, and he found to have uh, pneumonia on that right lower lobe. Based on the patient's vital signs and clinical appearance, would you, A, observe if the patient responds to your treatment, B, perform a blood gas, to assess the patient's CO2. C, perform a, a blood gas because the pulse oximeter value, which is really 98% may be inaccurate. D, both B and C, or E, just put them on a high flow nasal cannula. It looks like I'm not getting that bell curve that uh, Dan did, but that's okay. Okay, let's jump into it. Going to talk about pulse oximetry. This was one of the top 10 articles we picked for the, the, the year uh, in Journal Watch Hospital Medicine. As we all know, pulse oximetry non-invasively measures a patient's oxygen saturation. It does this by passing light. Uh, through the skin and measuring yeah. the change in absorbance. And it can be affected by the amount of melanin in skin. We have known that for a while, and some studies show that there may be this discrepancy between what we're measuring on our pulse ox and what may actually be in arterial blood. So this was the first study. Uh, we'll just rapidly go through three, but this was a big one. Shout out to Francois Roland, who summarized this study with, with me uh, for Journal Watch. It was a study done in three hospitals, all Mayo Clinic in Arizona, uh, Florida, and Minnesota. And they looked at about 128,000 measured pulse ox that were paired with arterial readings and 26,000 of those patients they looked at. And these were sick, sicker patients in the ICU or surgical inpatients over a three-year period. And they defined the cold uh, hypoxemia as a discrepancy in your arterial oxygen uh, saturation which was less than 88% when your pulse oximetry was showing that it was greater than 92%. And in this study, self-identified patients who identified themselves as black were significantly more likely to have uh, a cold hypoxemia, 6.2% versus 3.6% in, in, in white patients. And that, for every 38 patients, that was clinically relevant. 
This also was an issue in self-identified Asian and, and, and American Indian patients. However, because of the numbers, most likely, it didn't reach statistical significance, but something else to, to keep in mind. Now, you may say, well, what does that number translate? Does it actually worsen clinical outcomes? And the answer is yes. When patients do have occult hypoxemia, they do have a higher mortality. In surgical patients, the odds ratio was three, and in ICU patients, it was 1.4. And those are statistically significant. So, so occult high, hypoxemia does, does matter. This was also a study done in the VA. The, this was done in less critically ill patients. They were both medical and surgical patients in the VA. Uh, this study paired roughly 30,000 oximetry and arterial blood gas measurements that were taken 10 minutes apart over a six year period. In this study, they found actually a higher rate of, of occult hypoxemia in both blacks and whites. And it was actually a lot higher than I would have expected. And this difference was significant, but what also was significant is the absolute numbers of, of both. This actually occurred not in, in, infrequently. Last study, looking at pulse oximetry and its accuracy in patients with darker skin was a retrospective study that was done in a Boston ICU over about a 10 year period. This was pre-pandemic. All patients were on supplemental oxygen and uh, patients of color had significantly higher uh, SpO2 readings than white patients. However, conversely, their arterial uh, uh, SaO2 values were lower than, than white patients. And this was a small average difference when you look at these numbers, but keep in mind on an individual basis, they may actually lead to decisions that might, uh, might not be the right decisions. So the bottom line for these three pulse oximetry studies is that they add to what we already kind of knew that patients who have darker skin pigmentation are at risk from delayed uh, recognition of, of hypoxemia. Now, in some cases, that may be a big deal. In many cases, it, it may not, but in some cases, it really could be a clinical issue. And the first oximeter was just approved just last month that recognizes uh, uh, this discrepancy and is able to account for it. And it was recently cleared by the FDA. So you're gonna be seeing more and more of the pulse oximeters we use in the hospital have built-in safeguards to uh, el eliminate this discrepancy. But I think it's probably gonna take at least several years for that to be implemented. So the bottom line for this study is that if something just does not seem right in the data that you're getting, step back, and have a low threshold for obtaining a, a, a blood gas in patients who have a darker skin pigmentation and have a normal O2 sat on pulse oximetry. Now, I also would say based on that one study, you should just maintain a high index of suspicion for anybody too, because if a cold hypoxemia occurred 15% in white patients too, you should think about getting a, 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 a blood gas. So I'm trying to think when would this make sense? Most of the time, like in this patient study, case, you're going to get a blood gas because you're worried not only about their O2 sat, but about their ability to ventilate and their PCO2. So this might be useful to know in a stable patient, let's say, who's not tachypnic, who you're assessing for the need for home oxygen or some other reason where you're specifically looking at information obtained from the pulse ox uh, to, to make a clinical decision. Uh, but in this patient, uh, you're going to get a blood gas because you're worried about their ability to ventilate as well. They're breathing at 30, they're tachypnic. So all roads are gonna to lead to ABG uh, anyway, but keep this in mind. I think this is an important thing to realize. Next case. Oh, actually before that case too, I wanna to go back to Dan's family member. Uh, <laughs> this was uh, his brakes, his rear brakes. He said, oh, I'm making a little bit of noise. His brake pads were worn down to the nub. There was just no meat on the pads. And you can see that's, rotor is supposed to be smooth. It was uh, carved out. And and I'm not going to name, I mean, I, half the consults I get in the hospital are automobile related, not medical related. So, but there have been other faculty members who have had similar issues. They should not be named Kim Manning. Uh, and they have... <laughs> 
make a lot of noise. It's embarrassed to valet park their cars because they they just scratch, you know. So this was Dan's car. We put new rotors on it and got them back on. It's out the door. Okay, so next next case. And this, uh, well, I'll mention that in a second. You're called on cross cover for a patient who has a high blood pressure, 182 over 92. Patient was admitted for low extremity cellulitis. Patient does have a history of hypertension, takes amlodipine, five milligrams a day. The patient is asymptomatic, no headache, no shortness of breath, no chest pain, uh, et cetera. Would you, for this patient's blood pressure, A, give a PRN oral hypertensive based upon certain parameters, B, give a PRN IV hypertensive based upon parameters. C, titrate up the amlodipine from five to 10. D, add a second antihypertensive agent. Or E, in the immortal words of Professor Michael Lubin, uh, who unfortunately some of you guys may not know, he'd love to say, don't just, instead of don't just stand there, do something. A lot of times in clinical medicine, he would say, don't just do something, stand there. And that is Dr. Lubin in the middle, right there. And guess who's in the right upper right-hand corner? That's Danny Boy, exactly. That was him during his M4 year. Extra credit for anyone who recognizes the person next to Dr. Dressler. That's, that's, uh, in, in cardiology. he's in cardiology. He was my first intern at Emory on my first uh, month on the wards. And uh, that's Dr. Vasilis Baballeros and, uh, uh, Billy, as uh, we like to call him, who runs the TAVR program here uh, at, at Emory. Were the bow ties required? Uh, on Lubin's team, they were required because he was a big bow tie guy. He was also a big anti scrubs guy. And you, and, and you have to remember, too, just going back and we'll reflect on how medicine has changed. When I first started, too, these guys worked 29 out of 30 days and no scrubs post call. So definitely on Lubin's team, we weren't wearing scrubs. Okay, so back to the question. I think given Lubin such a shout out, his choice probably will be the overarching winner, but we'll see. Okay. All right, so this study from last year, we talked about this when last time we gave an update in hospital medicine about patients who develop hypertension in the hospital and what to do. And uh, in the absence of the guidelines, it's all over the place. Residents will probably laugh at this story because they've all experienced it. They get called in the middle of the night for a blood pressure that's elevated in an asymptomatic patient. And they say, okay, let's just uh, continue to monitor them. And the nurse goes, uh, are you sure? Are you sure? And then you might say, yes, I'm just, you're just telling me they have a risk factor for cardiovascular disease at 3 a.m. It's, it's not an issue. Just continue to do what we're doing. Uh, and then the nurse asks for your name and your PIC number so, they, <laughs> so, that, so that they can do document that. And what happens is if you don't get called, it's because somebody wrote a PRN to give the nurses something to do. And, and so now you have people doing stuff because they don't want to get called in the middle of the night, which is not the right thing. I can go on and on about that issue, as you can probably tell. But, but basically, this was a retrospective cohort study of over 200,000 non-critically ill patients at five teaching hospitals in Connecticut who had a diagnosis other than hypertensive emergency. They looked at patients who had cardiac diagnosis too. Typically, most studies have excluded patients with heart failure and other cardiovascular diseases, but they didn't for, for whatever reason. About 23,000 of these 200,000 met criteria for severe hypertension, BP systolic over 180, diastolic over 110. 9,000, about 40% of them received treatment. Out of those 40%, out of those 9,000, 21% retrieved, received treatment with IV med. So basically about 8% of patients who met criteria for severe hypertension in the hospital 
were being treated with an IV uh, antihypertensive. The results for the primary outcome looked at a MAP drop of 30% or greater, which could be a measure of potential harm. It's not a hard clinical endpoint, but it, it, it could be a measure of harm. And they looked at the, uh, an adjusted analysis of treated versus untreated patients. And I think it was no surprise, you know where I'm going with this, that patients who got IV antihypertensive treatment were more likely to have MAP drops of greater than 30% percent or more with a hazard ratio of 1.4. Now, the thing that was surprising that I want to give lip service to and talk about for a second is that paradoxically, patients who got oral antihypertensive were significantly less likely to have a MAP drop than those who got nothing. So what they're saying is here that patients who uh, actually uh, you gave an oral pill from had less of a blood pressure drop than if you did nothing. It makes complete no sense. And, but the question is you have to address that and figure out like, why was that? And there may be residual confounders. And also it may be that sometimes when you have a patient who you think might have several diagnoses, like for example, a GI bleeder comes in and their pressure is up. You may not want to give them an oral antihypertensive because you may be like, hey, listen, let's just give them a cushion and have permissive blood pressure. And then they might bleed and then their pressure would really drop. Or a patient who you're concerned about sepsis, they get septic, you don't treat their blood pressure because you're worried about sepsis, they get septic, and then their blood pressure drops anyway. So there may be other confounders here about why this finding was, was the case. And the way I would look at this result is that we have Another study, the Rostogi study, which was in the Cleveland Clinic that looked at patients uh, that got treated um, as, as uh, inpatients with hypertension, and they actually did worse inpatient when you aggressively treated it with IV or pills. And also when you discharge them, they actually did worse. They had a higher rate of 30-day readmission in AKI because they were on an up-titrated regimen of, of their pills. So so the one thing we could say for sure about this study is that IV antihypertensive have no use in patients uh, who uh, uh, don't have uh, any end organ damage and, and they really should uh, be discouraged. Uh, elevated blood pressure is often transient, right? We're giving boluses of fluids, patients have pain. There are many reasons in the hospital why patients' blood pressure may be transiently elevated. And uh, the apparent benefit of antihypertensives in this study is inconsistent with other studies. It doesn't move my needle one bit. I, I really would, would hesitate to, uh, on a cross cover uh, situation, up titrate someone's meds, because then what happens is that goes into the MAR, then that becomes the patient's now dose, that becomes the patient's discharge dose, and then the patients have worse outcomes uh, on follow-up. So I, I think that's what, how I interpret the, this study. So as most people said, uh, don't just do something, stand there. Okay, so next question. In relation to patient safety compared to 30 years ago, the hospital is safer given scientific advancements and work hours reform. B, hospitalized patients now have an overall greater severity of illness, so more adverse outcomes occur. C, it's unclear if inpatient care is safer, but what is clear is there's much work left to do. D, wait, there were no computers or cell phones in the 90s and no one slept? How could that be safe? I always joke around with my team saying when, when they asked what it was like, I said, we used to, I used to get a page and then in New York City have to look for a pay phone to, <laughs> to put, and put my hazards on, get out of my car, put money into a pay phone and call the uh, call back to hospital. So cool, the first attending got a cell phone. They're like, this is amazing. I take the train out to Long Island. I don't have to get off the train to, to, put, to pay, put money into a pay phone. I could pull from the train. I'm like, that's amazing. You know? <laughs> so we've come a long way uh, in, 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 that, in that period of time. Well, let me just get to the, to the question. I always forget to do that. And I'll just talk as the results come up. This study just came out this week, very timely. Uh, and I think a lot of people are gonna be talking about it. So we'll spend the last six or seven minutes uh, that we have uh, summarizing it. Okay, so a lot of you guys may be too young to, to uh, 
been around when the Institute of Medicine published its seminal work to air as human, but basically uh, this was picked up by the lay press because almost 100,000 people were, were they, they reported die each year as a result of medical errors. That's the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every day. And if we had that every day in this country, people would go nuts, but we have 100,000 people dying each year as a result of medical errors. The lay press and the public had a field day with this study. The crazy thing was though, that it was based on a study that was done eight years earlier, the Harvard Medical Malpractice Study and other studies in Utah and Colorado, but then they just were summarized in the IOM report and were, were picked up. But in that, about 4% of all hospitalizations had adverse events, and about a quarter of them were preventable. About 14% led to death, which equated to about one in 200 hospitalized patients dying from a medical error, which was shocking uh, to, to, to many people. So now the question is, 30 years later from the Harvard malpractice study, is healthcare any safer than, uh, than we once started? So this quickly, the timeline for error. After the IOM report, we had then the publication called Crossing the Quality Chasm, which basically noted the large disconnect between what we know scientifically, but what we actually implement in, in, in our practice. And then there was this also information from cognitive psychology and human factors engineering from the psychologist James Reason. And everyone probably is familiar with his Swiss cheese model of errors. Before, no one was talking about this. And now we were talking on it and it was in, in patients, uh, uh, in people's consciousness. And we always looked at this and before it used to be blame, shame, and retrain on the individual. And now it's like, let's look at the system factors that are actually causing these errors. So a change in the way we were thinking. We were asked, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality were, was asked to uh, at UCSF to publish a compendium. And since we were in collaboration with them, uh, we were fortunate enough to author several chapters. I authored a chapter in this compendium, Making Healthcare Safer. Dr. Dressler also did. Shout out to Lorenzo DiFrancesco. Erica Brownfield also authored chapters. And, and this was like for the first time, people were actually talking about how do we prevent medical errors where people had never discussed this before. So going back to this article this week, this was by David Bates. This was a retrospective cohort study in Massachusetts and looked at uh, preventability and severity of, uh, and frequency of medical errors. This was from 11 Massachusetts hospitals. They ranged in size from less than 100 to over 700, uh, also pre-pandemic. Uh, they looked at 2,800 admissions, not as big a study as the Harvard malpractice study, but it's fairly uh, sizable number of admissions. They defined an adverse event as any untended physical injury. Uh, and then let's look at uh, the results. Pretty, pretty significant findings that they revealed that at least one adverse event occurred in almost 24% of admissions. Now, among the close to a thousand adverse events, about a quarter will be judged, were judged to be preventable. Compare that to about 27% in the Harvard malpractice study. A third of them were deemed to be very serious, which required substantial intervention. Length of stay was significantly different, almost double uh, when an error occurred as well. A uh, preventable adverse event occurred in about 7% of all emissions. When you compare that to the Harvard malpractice study, a preventable uh, event occurred in about 1%, okay? But we'll talk about why it's apples and oranges, but when you do the math from the Harvard malpractice, it actually is a higher percent of all emissions uh, this time around. Adverse drug events were the most common, 39%, uh, and that was like drug, drug reactions that caused hypotension, AKI, altered mental status. We had dr drug-related errors too 30 years ago. I'm gonna show you a few of them that uh, I think you'll find interesting because we don't do this anymore. This was a, the most famous prescription ever written because it was the first time a physician was found medically liable in addition to the pharmacist who filled it. And uh, you may look like, what is that, Isardil? Uh, well, it, the, the, the prescription was supposed to be for Isodil, which is 20 milligrams QID, but the pharmacist gave philodipine, which is Plendil, because that I looks like a P and an L, 
patient wound up getting Plendal and died and family sued and the physician was found liable. Next prescription was from Grady. This is a classic too. First, first drug, uh, the doctor is writing for a PPI in the clinic, starts to write for omeprazole, realize, wait a minute, we don't have omeprazole on formulary, it's Prevacid, which is Lansoprazole. So he crosses out the O, the O is not crossed out effectively, and then starts to write Lansoprazole. So you have an L, you have an A, and you have an N, and then you have an S for Lansoprazole that kind of looks like a Z. And then you have an O that's interpreted as an A. So the patient's getting a lanzapine, not lansoprazole. Patient came back a month later with dyspepsia still and a flat affect. And basically, <laughs> and basically you had to describe the error. So this is a walk down memory lane. You guys don't have to deal with this anymore or see these types of errors, but they were very common back, back, in, back in the day. Okay. And then the other adverse events in this study were surgical or procedural events that you would think, patient care events, pressure ulcers, falls, and then healthcare associated infections. Okay, so do not try to compare the two studies. Your head will spin because they're just so different that 30 years apart, very hard uh, uh, to do that. One thing was that this study currently only looked at in the hospital. It did not look at outside the hospital, in the ER before admission, or even what the malpractice study did, which was looking at the actually clinic visits preceding the hospitalization. And so since you're not including errors that occurred in the emergency room, I'm gonna show you one error which occurred when, uh, when, I, when I was down in the ER in the mid nineties, just in terms of what wouldn't be included in this study. Just briefly, this was a chest x-ray of, uh, you know, kudos for anyone who could get what's happening. You probably can't see it, but basically patient came in with decreased breath sounds, uh, in, on the left hemithorax and got a chest tube for presumed pneumothorax without waiting for the chest x-ray. When the chest x-ray revealed a right mainstem intubation, and that was why there were no breath sounds on the left side, not a uh, pneumothorax. So basically the treatment of right mainstem uh, intubation is pull back the endotracheal tube, not put in a chest tube. Okay. Okay, so then the current authors also use a broader definition of what constituted harm. And so they were actually catching more errors and they worked in a time period where they had computerized triggers to find errors. So they basically were able to uncover more errors than the authors were able to do 30 years prior. So you really can't compare the two to two studies. But I will say though, returning to this question, are hospitals safer today? The answer is it's really unclear, un unfortunately. Over the course of time, hospitals have gotten much more complex. The stakes are higher. Many patients are pushed to the outpatient. So now you see a, a, a much sicker cohort of patients who are hospitalized. So it's really, really hard to answer the question. But what I'm gonna some conclude with, Don Berwick, who was the president for the Institute of Healthcare Improvement in his uh, editorial for this article in the journal said that he quoted uh, the, the statistician Edwin Deming said that you have to have constancy of purpose. Constancy of purpose is the first principle that he recommended for all leaders in management organizations. And it seems like we've taken our foot off the gas a little bit when it comes to patient safety. And the one thing that you have to say that if an error or an adverse event was in one out of 24% of the emissions, you have to say, that's not dramatic progress that we've made. And we really need to have renewed efforts. In the last 30 seconds, I'll say it's, it's tough though, right? Because you have all the administrators in the C-suite worried about diversity, equity, inclusion, worried about supply chain shortages, worried about burnout. But first do no harm is a primary tenant that we've all sworn. If we don't renew ourselves to keeping patients safe, what are we doing this for? So I think this is really, you're gonna see a lot more information about the study, I think in the future. And I think it's gonna renew our efforts to try and keep our patients safe. And sorry, I had to speed up at the end because we're trying to get it done before the hour. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you. Um, this would, and, and actually I love the, the end as being really a call to action, but um, really appreciate your time. I think we're at the top of the hour and, um, and probably can't formally take questions from the crowd, but, uh, but thank you.
also get a different sort of background. Thank you. Thank you.